And so um, I presented a tool called Sticky last year uh, here at Wikimania that tries to address some of these shortcomings. And so the main, the main feature here is you have this one area I've circled here. And the, the, the thing is, I show you an edit, and you can decide three things. You either tell me it's vandalism, you tell me it's innocent, or you tell me you don't know. And then when you click one of those buttons, it will show you a new edit, and so on and so forth. So um, the idea here is that I use my metadata scoring algorithm to basically pipe, pipe scores into a queue just like the other queue, but the difference is I store this queue on one of my servers. And it's a priority queue, such that edits with a high probability of vandalism go straight to the top of the queue. And then the only way out of the queue is that for someone else to edit the page or for you to click a button in my GUI when you tell me what it is. And so um, we, this, is, this is actually implemented. And um, so we have several active queues. The three systems I described that are active on Wikipedia that are capable of scoring edits, mine, the Wikitrust folks, there's these, these all have queues where they, where they insert these scores, and including um, Cluebot, the next generation, because um, there's cases where it just barely doesn't have enough confidence. It can still send me its scores, such that we can use those as the basis to enqueue edits. And so the key, the key things here are, because I have a formal innocent button, I can make sure that no one in my GUI ever sees the same edit twice. If someone clicks innocent, and th th then it's popped out of the queue, it's done, it's, no one else has to inspect it. And there's an, uh, a, re a reservation system, people check out blocks of edits from the queue, so no one is doing simultaneous work. So it, this, is, uh, this is all open source, and if we have a chance at the end of this, we'll pop up the GUI and, and we'll walk through a couple edits. Um, so let's talk about academic progress. Um, this is, I think, we're really where the next generation of on Wikipedia systems um, is sitting. So prior to 2010, everyone who was doing this research um, evaluated their, their, their systems independently. And so these people, I was doing metadata research, there were people doing language research. We really had no idea whose system was doing better because there was no standardized way to evaluate it. So um, last year, um, Martin Pothast, who's a researcher out of Germany, he decided to create a corpus, basically a gold standard. Um, and he created this, this list of 32,000 um, English Wikipedia revisions. And he outsourced people at the cost of 15 cents an edit from um, the Amazon Mechanical Turk to get them to label him for him. So this cost about $4,000 or so, I believe, to create, because he just didn't take one vote. I mean, he was, he was getting like three, three to five votes per edit to try to get some, consistence, some, some consistency among the votes. But this corpus it was a big deal, and it's now a standard in the field. And so what it really set up was a competition he hosted last year, where all these approaches could get together and, and see, see who had the best one. Um, a language approach one, that's one, W-O-N. Um, but, but more significantly than that competition was that it brought a bunch of Wikipedia researchers together, myself included, and last year at uh, Wikimania, we all got together and said, we have these three independent tracks of algorithms. We have the metadata folks, we have the language folks, and we have the content persistence folks. And we're all doing these different things. And what would happen if we were to put all of our approaches kind of together into a meta classifier? And so the goals there being to, to perform better in the long run, but also understand whose, whose features were, were most important. And so to give an idea of the scale at which these things operate, so I think now we have an algorithm with uh, 70 plus data points that's the combination of all these features. And if you zoom in there, you, you can read all about them. But the point here being the problem space, I, we're getting confident now, is, is quite well covered. There's not too many things to parse out that exist anymore that we have not parsed out already. But so let's talk about the performance here. So um, this is what you call a precision recall graph. I don't know, let me see if I marked it, yeah. So the way, th these are a common representation machine learning. So basically the way you read it is um, along the bottom. Um, so that point right there is at approximately 0.3. So that says you can find about 30% of vandalism with about 99% accuracy. So that means you could probably find about 33% in this case at, at, at a 1% false positive rate. And so uh, when we combined all these things together, it, it worked really well and it worked way better than any of these single approaches did. So, th so there's, there was not unique overlap. And so it's now the current baseline for performance. And it suggests that um, once we get this actually online and running in an implementable fashion, um, it should be able to uh, ex exceed known performance, the best known performance levels, which right now is the Cluebot NG folks, since they are 
they have a bot, they have a bit of an advantage over the rest of us since they don't require humans to look at edits. And so um, looking at individual feature sets here, we see that um, kind of the green, the green line there, the language features are interesting. And so we see that for, for a small percentage of edits on the left there, it's extremely helpful. And these are, these are features with high accuracy. But um, towards the middle there, there's a sharp decline. And so this kind of speaks to the fact that these vocabulary words, when you know bad vocabulary words, they're very helpful. But there's a certain point there where once you get beyond a comfortable vocabulary, it's, it's, it's worthless. And obviously, we're, we're really beating ran random guessing very extremely well. And so there was a new, um, new edition of the competition this year, and it had two real changes. Um, the first of which was that the uh, corpus was in three natural languages. So, so, so pretty much all prior research had been done on English Wikipedia. And the second was that you're allowed to use future evidence. And so um, these things aren't published until September, but um, I did very well on it, so we'll talk about my approach, at least. So my strategy was we want more metadata. Um, language specifics are hard to implement. I don't speak Spanish and I don't speak German. So um, basically throw, throw those out. And in the process, you could create a model which is portable for all language editions. And so if we look at the evaluation results along these lines, um, they're, kind of, they're kind of interesting in that um, English Wiki or my evaluation over English Wikipedia was by far the worst of these languages. So, so um, if you, the way you judge these is, is typically by the area underneath the red curve. The more area that's underneath the red curve, the better you're doing. If you could imagine a red line that looked like this at a right angle, that would be perfect performance, which says your algorithm never makes an error, and the area under the curve would be one in that case. So what we see here is that the area under the English curve is, is slightly less than the other cases. And so um, this is something interesting that's, that's still to be resolved. And it might be a result of something like the edit filter being enabled on English Wikipedia, which means that these edits are getting blocked. And so some of the low-hanging fruit in the trivial vandalism never even makes its way into the English corpus. But um, th this, this bias still needs to be studied. And, and we'll skip that at the entrance of time. And so there's also been some other, some other research that should be noted this, this year, not just in my track, but in people who think about these things. And so um, one of them um, labeled as, as reference 14 here is this, this massive graph at the bottom. And the idea is we shouldn't be just looking for vandalism with a single model, but we need to develop tags for the different types of vandalism. Um, and so massive deletes have a very different signature than bad word insertions have a very different signature than, you know, bad formatting or repeated characters. And so as a first pass, we should try to detect which type of vandalism it is before we try to apply a very specific model for that. And there's also an interesting paper here about tools like Huggle in the, in the formal warning process. So let's briefly talk about the future here and how, these, and how these scores, as they continue to be more accurate, can be, can be integrated better into the community. And so the first is, is pending changes, which is obviously high, highly controversial, at least on English. And so basically the idea is, we talk about that priority queue for the, as part of the sticky tool. And what if we were to take the very top worst edits as part of that and, and kind of dynamically move those under pending changes protection? So as the graph at right shows, we, we score the algorithm, we score the edit, right? If it's really bad, we revert it. If it's really good, we just let it live. But if it's in this middle ground where it's kind of suspicious, and maybe say an IP editor made it. We should, we should just flag that immediately and say, no, we're not gonna let this edit go live on Wikipedia until someone with the reviewer rights gets to actually inspect it. And so there's also been a proposal to um, smart watch lists um, at a site here. This was something um, I think took place on Jimmy Wales' talk page. Basically this idea of coloring, coloring watch lists for vandalism and, and not just showing the most recent change, but showing a whole history of changes since someone last accessed the page. And so kind of my final point here is um, the, the tools on Wikipedia do need to work better together. And so kind of what I propose here is something I call the anti-vandalism clearinghouse. Um, so while I like to prop my tool up sticky and the no notion that we have this innocent edits, the fact is most people still use Huggle and I don't think I'm gonna convince them otherwise. But what if they, everybody could talk in, a, in an IRC channel and say, I know this person looked at this link and they didn't revert it. And that's kind of an implicit innocent. And if like all the bots could put their scores in and all the tools could speak back and forth about who's looking at what edits, there could be a whole lot less um, rep rep repetitious work. 
And finally, from, from kind of the foundation side, it would be interesting to, if we could have um, some support from, from them in terms of um, just space to run these algorithms. Because, um, so Cluebot gives its scores to me, right? And um, so one day I, uh, I noticed they weren't giving me scores anymore and I went to their IRC and I'm like, oh, what's, what's going on guys? It's like, you're not giving me scores. And it's like, we know the bot's down because um, its owner had to take the computer to a LAN party. And this, this absolutely blew my mind that something that's performing dozens of edits a second on Wikipedia could be stopped because somebody had to go to a LAN party. So, <laughs> and so, um, as, as I mentioned, um, the space is pretty well covered. So moving forward, um, most, mu much of the research is looking at kind of the really dangerous subsets of vandalism. Um, I've had my fun reverting the work of 12-year-olds at, at their high school. I'm trying to look for more dangerous things. So obviously the next talk we'll talk about um, external link spam, who should be financially motivated. And there's also going to be a paper published at Wikisim, the academic conference, about deleted revision. So um, revision deletion, not deleted pages. And the notion that um, um, certain administrators have the ability to delete edits that um, specifically for legal reasons, if they show uh, liability, <coughs> defamation, revelation of privacy information, these are things which endanger um, the foundation legally, it would seem. So it's, so it's interesting to understand these edits. And with that, I'll open that up for questions. Yeah. Have you heard of tool server? I have heard of tool server. So can you not run the box on the server? Well, I'd, you should, maybe I'll get the clue out in. I mean, I, I have plenty of resources myself, but I know that these, these particular people do, n do not, so. <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm aware of the tool server, so. Okay. So to repeat that, they, they are moving to the uh, tool server. Um, well, there, 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 um, there is. So um, the precision calculation take, takes that into account, I believe. So. So, so, so these, so it's not these. You're not. We're not talking about accuracy. We're plotting precision here, which is slightly different. Um, there's, there's, you can look it up, there's a formula, so if not, we'll take this offline, I can't, true, it's true positives over true, you know, okay. there are three of those quantities in a, in a, in a fraction. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you, for your speaking, yeah. um, your one of your goals was to reduce repeated effort, but uh, wouldn't uh, Yeah, so um, that's, of course, a concern. Um, so um, IPs aren't allowed to use it. We're considering only if people with the rollback right should be allowed to use it. But uh, I mean, this is, this is, ultimately, we're building a collaborative queue on top of a collaborative wiki. Um, it, m many of the same problems carry right over in terms of civil attacks and things of that nature. Um, at some point, you could always require a voting algorithm where two people have to say, innocent in order for it to be kicked out of the queue, things like that. But and because you're curing it, you can distribute the, the second one, it would be very unlikely. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So that we haven't had those problems yet, so why waste the additional one review per edit at this point? Yes. Okay. No. So, so uh, I have some very, I have some very crude monitoring tools. I'll, I'll say um, I get, 
I have certain triggers where if somebody's moving what looks to be a little too quickly, or I know um, kind of the accuracy at which these algorithms should operate, um, if it starts to fall outside those, I can go in and look and see who's, see who's doing what work. Yes? Yes. Um, so, I guess it's, so when we're talking about the good edit, bad edit collection, that's a lot of what the pot has to individual did in outsourcing these and giving, giving them to Amazon Mechanical Turks. So that's, so, um, yeah, and I'll admit there's, there's probably some slight degree of, of bias in that data set because if these people really know what vandalism is or isn't is questionable, probably, but um, it, it's the best there is out there to date. And so this is, this is um, a, a screenshot of a sticky tool. Um, you can see there's these three buttons here. You press vandalism. He read sausage. I think that you can read that. So you click vandalism, and it's just popping these things out of a queue. And then, like uh, this, this area down here reports um, what happens. So this, this guy down there was scrolled back, and we gave him a warning level two of, of basically four on English Wikipedia. So it just does all that and just feeds you edits basically. And if you, yeah. So I'm not going to sit here and obviously. But if you click here on the revision queue, this determines who's feeding you the edits. So right now, this, these are edits being fed by Cluebot, but you can also select any of the other algorithms. So because they right now have orthogonal approaches, uh, sometimes once one queue gets kind of dry and there's not much vandalism, and you shift to the next one, and, and you'll find find some 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 vandalism there. Yes. So so yes, I'm lo I logged in before the stop the talk started here in the top left. Uh, you just uncheck the uh, award editing editor box right there. Yes. Yes. So basically, everything that I every every click that happens in here is fed back into the machine learning al algorithm because then I have definitive labels from from humans to improve the scoring process. So now we're going to talk about an interesting subset of this, the most interesting subset. Because having looked at thousands and thousands of these edits myself, um, it becomes a little discouraging um, knowing, knowing who you're reverting. And that I'm, I'm a security researcher by, by training. And so reverting the edits of 15-year-olds of um, isn't the world's most fulfilling thing for me. So I started to think, like, what, what's a more, how do you find a smart attacker in this space? And so the big idea is I wanted to design a framework to catch these people including those employing one subtlety. So, so certain attackers who want to get their link to stick on Wikipedia will be very subtle, and they'll kind of just stick into the flow of things, put it at the bottom where it belongs, give it a good description, don't, don't look too bad. But, but there's a second class, which is um, some of the vulner vulnerabilities in recent literature. In particular, um, I wrote a paper describing how um, one, one could do, do bad things with link spam to Wikipedia. And so as part of kind of an ethical responsibility almost, um, I, I have this paper which um, fixes it. <laughs> and so then, much like we talked about, this, this feeds right into the other stuff. So we hope to do the really bad stuff by bot, and the rest will hand to something like Sticky that can prioritize the inspection of the rest. So let's begin by talking about the motivations. Everybody should know what, what kind of link spam is by nature. It's and seen obscenely subjective based on the based on the policy, and um, there's two real things that can go wrong with a link. And so the first is the intuitive; it's the destination, right? So if you link to um, some shock site, that's obviously a bad destination. Um, commercial sites, similarly. And there's also more subtle things like what Wikipedians call non-notable sources and stuff like that that will probably would not be con you would never see in an email spam type situation. And the second, you can have issues with presentation. And so um, if you put a link on line zero, um, even if it's to the New York Times, that that's probably should be considered a spam link per, per the policy that has, has been established. And so why, why is link spam an interesting area of research? 
So it's not entirely different from um, things like forum spam and blog spam. Um, and there's a lot of literature on how to detect um, spam, in the, spam in these types of scenarios. But wikis and, and Wikipedia in particular is, is unique for a number of reasons. And the first is that when you think about blog comments, they're typically append only in nature. So if a spammer wants to add something, where is it going? It's going straight to the bottom of an article where it receives less attention. And there's also generally you can't do markup in these type of environments, whereas it's kind of an inherent part of Wikipedia editing that you could put something in line zero, size 100 font, a la. You could, you could do that quite, quite easily. And second, there's massive traffic. Obviously, Wikipedia is sixth, seventh most popular website on the internet. Um, it's a humongous amount of viewership um, to the, that could see your spam links if you were to get them up there. Um, third, there's a large topic space. So a lot of spam, like email spam filters and, and, and spam in blog comments depends on looking at the topic of the post and then looking at the topic of the comment. And if these two don't agree, if someone, if you're trying to talk about, um, I don't know, soccer balls, and they're down there trying to sell Viagra, there's a topic disagreement here, and this, this screams spam. But um, with a huge topic space like there is on Wikipedia, um, you can take your Viagra pharmacy, walk right over to the Viagra article, post it at the bottom, and this looks completely kosher to these types of algorithms, right, because it's context appropriate. And finally, we're looking at a community-driven mitigation system here. A lot of the other big players, like the Facebooks and whatnot, they have a staff who's dedicated to look for these types of things, uh, which, which were not, uh, I guess, financially afforded. Or, I mean, not to say that there's not a great group of volunteers, but there's, there's something to be said for somebody forced to sit there and do it. And so, um, as, as we survey, there's a lot of research on vandalism, but, but link spam is kind of an interesting subset. So. Um, Link spam is likely to serve the posters off interest, and we're going to assume even that it's probably financially might um, in the case of commercial sites. So when there's money to be made, um, people will come out of the woodwork from, from everywhere. And so therefore, when we block these people, or, or we'd expect them to be very intelligent um, in the way that they conduct, conduct their behaviors on, on Wikipedia. And if you look at the sophistication at which the email spam game is played, it's extremely technical. And, and why are attackers willing to do this? Well, because there's money to be made. And so um, in an in a academic paper, I looked at Wikipedia link spam. I created a corpus, which we'll talk about how that was done. And basically, I found like existing spam on English Wikipedia to be what we call a nuisance level. It happens. It annoys people. But uh, it's not really pervasive. And it's probably an order of magnitude smaller than the vandalism problem. And there was just less sophistication. Even, even the attackers didn't seem to be mechanized. Or have, or have a lot of these functionalities. And I found that it's mainly because people were subtle. They were following the rules in trying to get links to persist for a long period of time. And so this didn't really make sense to me, um, because I have a lot of technical experience with Wikipedia. So I began to ask if I was to be a smart attacker, how, how would I link spam Wikipedia? And so um, I described this model, and um, some statistical estimation shows that I could indeed make a, a lot of money in this way. And so we're not going to talk about the super details of this, of that, for a couple reasons. <laughs> um, but one thing you can look at here is um, there's certain traffic spikes. Um, traffic is not distributed uh, uniformly across Wikipedia articles, obviously. So if we're to look at the top table here in peak views a second during, two th during like the first three quarters of 2010, um, when the Super Bowl halftime show was being played, um, The Who, who played, and Pete Townsend, their guitarist, these articles were getting about 200 hits a second. And um, you can only imagine what would happen if you were a link spammer and smart enough to figure this out. Yes, the community might catch you quickly. And what does quickly mean here? Does it mean 30 seconds? Because if it means 30 seconds, your prized Viagra link just received 6,000 views, which is equivalent to a whole lot of email work, given how good email spam the filters are. And there's not just these cultural spikes. I mean, you're looking at certain articles here who consistently receive a huge number of hits per day. And so um, let's assume you're going to get caught. So remember that link where we had the huge font in the top and all that? Well, if you're just going to, we expect them to catch you, right? So let's just make sure everybody sees our link and we give everybody the chance to click on it. We're still going to have our 20 seconds of glory, and that could be a huge amount of traffic in that period. So, but hold on, you say. Well, these popular articles, they're smart enough to lock those down, right? Well, you know, yes, they do. They're at least locked down to auto-confirmed users. But there are trivial ways, script-driven, without a human touching a button, to get auto-confirmed accounts. 
And um, if you want to do this at massive scale, you're going to need a botnet or something like this, a distributed fashion, so to get around the IP blocking. But um, there's, there's well-known ways to do this. And there's also other concerns. Um, there's a tool called XRumor out there, which is designed to spam wikis, um, not necessarily huge installations like English Wikipedia. But basically, it goes around the internet and finds forms and just fills them out um, with good guesses as to what should go there. But um, it always includes its, uh, its own link, of course, to try to attain backlinks and do search engine optimization. And there's also this much cited um, Eric Goldman paper about how there's a less of a labor force at, uh, uh, running around at Wikipedia. And that would imply even more latency in the attack I just described. If you know 10 second stretches to 15, you're talking about perhaps thousands more hits. So to study link spam and, and how to detect it, we need to build a corpus. Uh, you know, we need to label some edits as spam or ham. So spam edits are those that add exactly one link. The link is only the really thing, only the thing that's added really, and that they were rolled back. So we'll get into that more in a second. And ham edits are just edits that meet the same criteria, but instead of being rolled back, they were added by a privileged user. Privileged here means roll back or roll back admin or more. So the idea here is that um, I can look back into Wikipedia history, I can parse these things implicitly, and therefore for, for free, and um, I can allow these administrators who really understand the Wikipedia infrastructure to define spam for me on a case-by-case -case basis based on where they committed the uh, rollback actions. So here's, an, here's a snapshot of the vintage clothing article where someone added a um, buy your vintage dress link, which, which seems to be a quite clear instance of spam. And so we'd call this, if, if, if that link was indeed rolled back in the next edit by an administrator, we would call this spam. A, because one link was added, and two, because it's the, it's just, this is really the only thing added. So when the, when the administrator decided to press the rollback button, the only thing that could have possibly been wrong was that this link was bad. And so we, in fact, know the link was bad. If we look at this edit, for example, there's also one link added somewhere in there. This does not pass the context criteria. There could, if this was reverted, there could have been a thousand things wrong with it. And so this is not one we can include in, in the corpus. And so we did this for about um, a couple months early of this year. And we ended up with this corpus of about 6,000 edits, um, about 81% ham, and about 1,000 instances of spam. And, and, and in that process, we also went and got the HTTP link. Whatever they were linking to, we fetched the source so we could process it later. And so now we have this data set, we have to determine the indicators or the features that are characteristic of spam or, or, or ham. And so we have a list of 55, which we'll now discuss in detail. Kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll focus on the ones that make pretty graphs, to be honest, or just really good indicators. And so they, they pull from three fields. So we can look at the Wikipedia-driven features, the metadata kind of, like we did with vandalism. We can also look at the HTML source of the page and process it. And third, we can contact third parties. And in particular, we talked to Alexa and the Google Safe Browsing Project about these things. So Wikipedia features, we can look at the URL, all types of quantities for about that, about the article, where in the article was added, the history of the URL, how many times the URL was added this week, how many times in the past day. There's an enormous number of things that we quantify um, along these lines. But what are some of the, what are some of the best ones? And so we see that log URLs tend to be good URLs um, and, and two, for two reasons. We can imagine that the former here linking to a general domain. That's something used for, present, for promotional purposes. Whereas if you're citing a particular and very exacting document, you could imagine that there's a specific encyclopedic fact on that very specific page which someone wants, wants to see. And similarly with the domains, we see that 38% um, 30, of all spams link directly to, to a general domain, not, not going further along the file path. Um, second, we see that spam is rarely used inside the citation environment. That's pretty intuitive. Um, advanced editors are probably only aware of this syntax, and they are exceedingly unlikely to be spammers, um, at, you know, as, the, as the numbers show. So um, much, much like with um, Vandalism, we see that spammers often refuse to leave a revision comment. So about 85% of these spam edits leave no reversion comment whatsoever, and uh, less than 20% of ham edits um, do the same. And we can also look at the three-letter domain which the URLs have. And so what we see here at the far left is the, um, 
.com and .info and .net domains tend to be spammy, whereas things like .edu, .gov, and .org tend to be well behaved. And this is, this is pretty intuitive. Um, these, these, these areas have more administrative control. They also cost more. So if you need to be a truly dedicated spammer, you're going to use cheap domains for high turnover. And so one of the most interesting correlations here is um, if we look at where, where in the article a link was added versus how old the article is. So what I've highlighted here at the top are articles that are old, more than five years. And if we highlight that half on the red half, these are articles which are added to a bottom, the bottom of a page. So basically, if you try to add to the external link section of a very old page, there's a high probability that that's vandalism. And so kind of the argument here is that external links, you know, are, that's where a lot of people use for promotional purposes. And that over time, these pages evolve, but eventually they stabilize and people decide, well, this is the appropriate set of links which should be here, it would seem. So that subsequent editions, um, they, they, they get rejected. Nothing survives down there. So as I talked about, we also fetch the um, HTML source and process it. We can look at things like how commercial it is. There's complex algorithms to that, how profane it is. Um, and these things, these things really don't work, to be honest. And this speaks to the great diversity of spam that I I is on Wikipedia. These, these things aren't all commercial driven. They're not all shock sites. They're only marginally more profane or more commercial. Um, similarly, there's been studies done on email spam, and we re-implemented some of their things. They say that how big the landing site is, how complex the, vac the vocabulary is, um, what, what the compressibility ratio is. Um, these, these should all give indicators, and we found actually the complete opposite results that these other papers were indicating. Again, the takeaway here, speaking to um, there's subtlety and link diversity are, are abound in the status quo of um, Wikipedia spam. <coughs> So we, we, also party, we also create two third-party sources for every link we get on Wikipedia. And so the first is the uh, Alexa web service. And so um, they give us traffic data, who is data, things like that. And we contact the Google folks for their safe browsing lists. So they maintain these URL lists that contain sites that are known to host malware and known to be engaging in phishing behavior. And so it turns out that no one's using um, Wikipedia to distribute malware. Um, at, at the current point in time. So these, 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 there were zero hits, essentially. Nothing showed up. But that doesn't mean this, this technique is worthless. So um, obviously, we're going to take this analysis, which I did offline, and we're going to build it into a live online tool. And so we, we still include these features, because it's pretty straightforward that if somebody tries to add a link that hits one of these lists, we should pop it up there with the highest priority, because something, something deviant is going on. But the Alexa data it, it is extremely useful. And so we're talking about, um, what we're graphing here on the left here is the CDF of um, backlinks. And so a backlink is just saying, on the entire internet, how many incoming links are there to your page? So if I'm cis.westand, it crawls the entire link and says how many people are pointing to cis.westand. And so this type of graph processing is what Google uses in its page rank algorithm. And this is what determines how search results gets, get, 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 get ranked. So we query um, Alexa for this, and it turns out to be the best single feature. So at median, a ham link, a good link, has 850 incoming links. But when we do the same query for a spam link, we find that they have 20, just 20 backlinks on the average. So these spam sites, they're not very popular um, on, on the internet. So that's a difference of 40 times. And second, we can look at the continent um, of where these things are registered. And we find that of them all, Asia is especially poor. Um, if your site is hosted in Asia, there's a extremely high likelihood it is, in fact, spam. Um, and so there's, Alexa also provides a lot of other good features about traffic and traffic deltas and histograms and stuff like that. And they really help the end approach, but they're really not fun to look at in this type of a setting, so we'll just ignore them. So how does this, how does this work? And so we take these, these 55 features or so, and we feed them into a machine learning algorithm called an AD tree. The, or AD trees. And so um, basically what it creates is something what we're looking at here on the right here. And so we start at the root node with a value of zero. And then it goes to the first link and it says, are there more than 200 backlinks? If there's 200 backlinks, you add 0.8, your score is 0.8, and you start traversing down that tree. If it's not, you take the other path. And so you traverse these trees, and at the bottom you end up with a final value, right? And so if the final value is positive, you have a good link. And if it's the final value is negative, you have a spam link. 
And so some intense math is used to take these, these 55 features for every single edit and feed them in there and create a tree like this. A whole lot of statistics going on that we're not going to talk about here. So in practice, we create this tree. Um, it includes about 35 features that are actually good enough to, to warrant a distinction. We have a tree depth of about 15, so you can imagine with um, expansion, what's the word? Exponential expansion, that you're, de you're dealing with a pretty big and complex set of paths here. And so then we evaluate it using a technique called cross-validation, which is pretty standard in the field. You learn from 90% of the data, you test it on 10%, and then you do it all over again. And so here, here's kind of the performance. Um, let's not look at the top blue line yet, but so we, we divide the features out into where they come from. And so there's Wikipedia, which is W, which is the top line of circles in there. And there's the landing site, which is the square bars, which is the lowest gray line. And then there's the uh, third party when they're right through the middle. And so we see basically when we look at our performance, which is the top blue line, that there's Wiki on Wikipedia features are a humongous driver of, of our performance. We'd only lose a couple percentage points of improvement if we were to completely forget the other two and just use Wikipedia. And so, um, that, that's, that's somewhat discouraging for someone like me who implemented all these things. We also have to think about robustness, right? If you're dealing with a smart vandal, by its very nature, the Wikipedia features are those which are easy to fool, right? Anyone can change the length of their revision comment. Anyone can change, you know, add a link slower. They could use a registered account, so on and so forth. But what's harder to fool are the other two types. You're not going to fool Alexa because you can't, it's going to be darn expensive to go around the internet and buy 100 sites so you can all point them back to this site. It's going to be really hard to go register another domain or pay a crap ton for like a .org domain so it doesn't look, get, get looked at suspiciously. So these, these are interesting features. If we do truly see deviant people in the future, we can create a new corpus, relearn over it, and features like this can be brought into force. And so here's probably the more intuitive of the performance graphs, which is how, how well do we do um, on, on the whole. So um, on the bottom here is the false positive rate, and then the top is the recall, or the percentage of edits, which you can, uh, bad edits, which you can find. It's got the objective function there. And so we see that um, a 0.5% false positive rate, you can find about two thirds of uh, all the spam, which is added to um, English Wikipedia, according to this analysis. And so um, that's a realistic false positive rate in terms of bot operation, because that's what most of the bot van anti-vandalism bots are given. So that means for every 200 links, it makes about one mistake. Um, yeah, so we can imagine that um, if we take two thirds of the spam problem on Wikipedia, that's an enormous amount of freeing of resources in terms of the humans who have been um, basically brute force searching through these links. And I mean, and, and then beyond that, as we've talked about the sticky thing, um, it's not like all hope is lost beyond that 66%, because we have a pretty good idea of their, of their ordering beyond that as well for human inspection. So we've, brought, so we've brought this live on Wikipedia. This is the same architecture we've been looking at all along for the sticky tool. We calculate, we get the magic scores, we put those into a priority queue. And that's, that's pretty uncontroversial. So we'll skip that for the time being. So um, much like we just, we, we, we just um, demonstrated the tool a couple minutes ago in terms of vandalism, um, it's the exact same tool um, for um, those edits. Um, the links become, they, they become hyperlinks in this case. Um, there's alerts popped up, for example. Um, if the Google safe browsing list were ever to be hit, um, it'll pop up a link saying, well, before you go manually inspect this site, you should probably know that it's hosting malware. Uh, we do a similar thing for adult content, such that reviewers, patrollers, don't go unknowingly clicking their way through to porn links. Um, but we'll, we'll defer that for the immediate time being. So, so it works. Um, it, 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 it's, it's working. Um, so there's a few adjustments. Um, so in our corpus thing, we said we could only add one link. We'll only look at links that add one link. But so when we do this online, we can't say the same thing, obviously, or a spammer would just add two links to get around it. So the philosophy is we score every link individually, and we take the highest score of those, and that's the score we applied to the edit. That way, no one can dilute a bad edit score. Um, so we had a crap ton of dead links on Wikipedia. Um, so I just report these to a special page right now. So I see some doubt there. And it's like, so why is somebody adding a link to Wikipedia which is dead? Um, it's often the case because of mass blanking vandalism. Right, so there's an empty page, and then somebody comes back and reverts that page, 
that looks like 20 or 30 new links getting added to the next revision. And so we chug through all those, uh, all 30 of those links on that page. And it's unsurprising that we find tons and thousands and thousands of, of dead links, quite literally uh, several thousand a day via this method. But that's, a, that's, a, that's an entirely separate problem. Um, so I talked about this great attack model I came up with at the beginning. And um, well, these, this, this magic AD tree doesn't, isn't going to capture that attack because it's not currently in use. It's not in the corpus. The corpus doesn't show any of those, those characteristics. So we have a, a class where I've manually written these rule sets in such that we can do kind of signature-based detection um, along those lines. And um, the final topic here is gamesmanship. I've talked about how uh, we always assumed an attacker would try to get around these things. So how, how would an attacker defeat this system and kind of what work remains to make this more and more robust? And so the first one is content optimization, like I discussed. It's really easy to make your revision summary longer and make yourself self look like less of a spammer via that method. But aside from that, um, we have to watch out for something called TOC, T-T-O-U attacks. And this stand, stands for time of check to time of utilization. And so basically what we see, just like with vandalism on Wikipedia, is that when somebody adds a link, everybody inspects it. There's all this patrolling going on in like the first probably, you know, two to five minutes of its life. And then no one ever looks at it again. So what does a smart attacker do is um, they add a link to their site uh, and they add a redirection to the New York Times, something related, right? They, everyone clicks through, the patrollers, oh, this is great, it adds, this is a reputable source, perfect, leave this link in. Five minutes later, they go to the HTML page, change the redirection, and change it to a completely different site. And because this is happening not on Wikipedia, but on the server side of the attacker, um, this, this doesn't raise anyone's attention, but visitors will continue to leave the link. And if you look, um, this is a practical concern, there's a long-term abuse case called, um, look up, if you visit that idea, he's called Universe Daily. Um, He's been doing this, I think, for several years and claims to have thousands of links on Wikipedia right now that um, he, he's succeeded with this tactic. So this, this, is, this is a real threat. How do you address this? Um, it's, it's tough because to reprocess 37 million links every day um, is, is, is non-trivial. Similarly, there's crawler redirection. If you know where I'm coming from and where my special bot's going to investigate you, we'll just serve good content to my bot and serve bad content to all the humans who read through Wikipedia. And finally, we can imagine denial of service attacks, people just basically taking down my server by adding a trillion links at once to Wikipedia. These are ultimately attacks against the encyclopedia too, so I'd assume that someone else would, would catch them. And this is, this is the future work moving forward. And that's, that's all I have. So, um, yeah, so there's a whole lot of bot de detection infrastructure which we haven't discussed. There's blacklist, there's, I mean, it, it, goes, it goes on and on. Um, but, but this was still a particular point of focus just because um, the, the model which I, the aggressive attack model, right, it all feeds off of seconds of human latency. And so the time it takes for things like blacklist and account blocks and warnings to accumulate, that's just, that's just more, more and more seconds. But in terms of how this has influenced the corpus, um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, right? Because um, uh, there's, there's no statistics out there that I'm aware of of, of, how, the, of how effective the blacklist even, even is against repeat attackers, so. 